Hello everyone, I'm Andy Davo and welcome back to another one of my race guides for Blue Bowl 3. Today in the spotlight I'm going to talk to you about Skaven. This video is going to contain several different features. Uh, first of all I'm going to start talking to you about the players and then how to level them up and all the different options you've got available there. Then I'm going to talk to you about rosters so you've got the best starting rosters uh, that money can buy. Then we'll move into some strategy advice, how do you actually play the team, both on offense and defense, and I'm going to include into that some starting rosters for you. And then finally, I'll close the video out. We're going to go and look at inducements, as usual, uh, and all the different things you could pick, and what's good and what's not. On to Skaven themselves. Skaven, for me, are a, a great team, probably one of the cheesiest teams out there. They are exceptionally fast. They've contained the fastest players in Blood Bolt 3. They have access to mutation skills, which makes them exceptionally exciting and gives you a lot of versatility on how to build them. And also, a lot of the players are quite cheap, so you can get a lot of players for your money. Unfortunately, however, uh, those players are also very low, low armor, so they will die a lot. And they have they struggle to get away from your opponent, so not only are they low armor, disengaging and stopping getting punched for some other players is incredibly difficult, and that leads and it, it increases the ability for them to spiral. So, without further ado, let's go and look at the players. Right, based on your comments uh, in the previous video, you asked me to separate the players out a little bit and make them a little bit easier to see. So, I've put some spacings in, and I hope that's what you meant based on your comments. First of all, we've got five different players for Skaven, and I'm going to start off with the big boy himself, the big Rat Ogre. The Rat Ogre is the Skaven big guy, and unlike a lot of the other big guys, his movement six, so it's incredibly fast. It is standard at strength five, and it's also got a reasonable agility roll for a big guy of agility four plus. So if you want to dodge with it in a pinch, four plus isn't terrible. It can't pass, but it is unfortunately not very armored. It's only AV nine plus. Skills wise, we've got the standard mighty blow. We've got frenzy, so it's very good at blitzing things. Loner four plus, fine. And then it has two interesting skills. Uh, the first of which is prehensile tail. So if we are Asking our opponents to dodge away, then they are receiving an extra minus one modifier for dodging. So, for example, uh, an elf lineman is going to be dodging away from this guy on a three plus, not a two plus. And that's great if you know how to use it. So, yeah, biggins and chaos warriors probably not so scared of this player, but elf teams absolutely you can use that prehensile tail uh, in conjunction potentially with other skills and and make elves have a, a real problem. And the other interesting skill that this guy's got uh, is this one here, animal savagery. And for this reason, before I explain the skill. This absolutely splits the community. Uh, some people love the Rat Ogre and think it's so reliable now and absolutely think it's amazing. And some people absolutely hate it. In the Chaos Renegade guide video, I covered it and said that the Rat Ogre was a mutt's pick uh, over the Minotaur. And I think for a Skaven team now, it is also an absolute must pick. And although Animal Savagery now means that if you try and move on a 1-3 to three and you fail that, now the Rat Ogre will try and punch one of your players in the face... And then it'll do what it's told. Or on a blitz, if you roll a one, again, you'll punch one of your own players in the face and then do the blitz. Now, it is absolutely a double-edged sword, but it means that in a pinch, you can guarantee your blitz with a big guy. No other big guy in the game without this trait is able to do this, and therefore it actually removes a level of unreliability on your big guy. Not something I would recommend you set up and do every single turn, or you're going to run out of Skaven. But very useful for key plays like surfing a player, scoring a one turn, trying to blitz the ball carrier, that sort of thing. And it means that you've got to really think about your play positioning around the Rat Ogre all of the time. Do you want someone there potentially that might get punched in the face or do you want to move everyone away and then activate the Rat Ogre? You know, the situation will determine that. Now when it comes to skill ups, that makes leveling this player quite interesting. While we're carrying on talking about animal savagery, uh, the mutation skill in here, which gives you claws, which would stack normally very well for a Rat Ogre, is something you've just got to ponder just for a second. Because if you take the claws skill, you must move the Storm Vermin away because they're your better armoured players and you do not want to be playing claw and then Mighty Blow on your own player. So if you take claws, just be aware of what you've got to do, if at all possible. I do think claws on my Rat Ogre is something I would absolutely look to take, but I don't think it's an early pick. So going into the early picks... There are two different ways to play this. Uh, you either take Juggernaut first because you're blitzing with it and you want a standard strength skill and it makes your jug your blitz is absolutely more, much more likely. It is also very good for one turning because it turns both down into a push. So now you can semi-reliably uh, one turn. Uh, we'll come into that in the strategy section. Or uh, if you really want to try and use an actual blitzer and you want to be causing a load of knockdowns, then you want to jump into the block 
and that's that's the first skill. So for me, the first skill is either block or juggernaut, depending on how you're going to use him. And then once you've got one or the other, you probably don't need the other version. There is an argument, of course, for taking juggernaut and block uh, because knocking things over is great and it gives you a level of reliability. And it's not to say that's bad, but I think you can get by with one of those two skills. Absolutely think you need to take guard. It's a core skill on all teams. And as you can get it for, you know, for a standard skill, you should take it. And then I also think Stand Firm is very good because that combos quite nicely with your prehensile tail. Once you've rammed the uh, the Rat Ogre in somewhere, you want to, you want it to stick. So uh, I would, would very much look at Stand Firm. Other skills that are of interest, which are, are out here, we can't take Grab, unfortunately, because we've already got Frenzy. We don't want to take Break Tackle, so we can skip past that. Thick Skull's terrible. Pile Driver is terrible. Armbar is an interesting skill, and it does have share some synergy with your prehensile tail. So if we're going to talk about skills that do work, armbar is a, yeah, if I, if I randomed an armbar ogre, I wouldn't be upset. It's not what I'm going to go pick, but it, I, I'd accept it on a random. Brawler, interesting skill. Again, if you randomed it, I wouldn't be terrible, but um, not great. And so since there are only a few skills you can actually pick, there is an argument for randoming on a rat ogre because that's okay, that's okay, that's brilliant. Um, that's terrible. So we're currently two to one. That's brilliant. You can't have that. That's very good. That's very good. That's terrible. That's terrible. You can't get that. So actually, I think there's a 50-50 shot if you're getting something really good on a randomly rat ogre. And because of that, I think I'd very much consider it. Jumping into the other trees, I can't look past block in this skill tree. Uh, and, and that's where I need to go. Tackle's fun, but it's starting to cost a lot of money. Um, and there's nothing really else in here other than possibly pro uh, again but you're starting to make a very expensive rat ogre. So avoid that if you can. If you can. You're only taking these sorts of skills uh, as luxury fifth fifth skill, really. Regarding uh, characteristics, st stat line on a rat ogre doesn't really change if you increased its movement from six, six to seven, and I think it's expensive, so I wouldn't bother. You're unlikely to hit the golden strength. You don't want agility. You can't have passing, or you, you shouldn't take passing, and I, and I don't think, really, you want armor value unless you know you're playing into a team, load of teams like Orcs, where they've not got claw access, but they are strength. So Orcs and Dwar yeah, orcs Dwarves um, would be okay in a league format. You could take armor value, but I think there are better normal skills out there. Right, next we're going to move into the Storm Vermin. This one you're allowed two of. Always take both the Storm Vermin. They are core positionals you absolutely need. They are faster than average players. We've got movement seven. And for all Skaven, the base movement on a Skaven player is seven, and some are a bit faster than that unless it's the big guy. Strength 3, fine. Agility 3, fine. Passing's terrible. Uh, and the Rama 8+. plus. They are your best armoured players. They do start with block, which is brilliant. But the actual most important thing about this player is its general strength access on a primary. And you can build some really good players. So we've already got block. We probably want to be building uh, a killer and a support. So your killer is really easy. We need to take tackle. And we need to take mighty blow. Once we've got both of those, I think I would take guard anyway. And I would also absolutely jump into the mutations tree and I would take claws. And I think I would actually go, depending on what you're playing into, you want to take tackle, mighty blow, claw, and then guard as a, as a fourth skill. But you do want to take guard on the, on the player. As a final sort of rounding it out skill, horns is all right if you're playing uphill lots of strength all the time because it means your player is then blitzing on a four, uh, strength four. That might make the difference and make it so you can actually hit stuff. Nothing really else in here that I think you need to be considering possibly two heads if you have to be running away a lot but uh, I think I think horns allows you a bit more firepower and then you could also look at juggernaut and stand firm juggernaut if you're blitzing a lot lets you roll pushbacks and, and uh, take down wrestle players so if you're in an elf heavy league juggernaut's a great pick so a lot of these picks are dependent on where you're at once you've taken the core skills uh, which are tackle mighty blow and claw and then probably guard on your other Storm Vermin, you're looking probably more as a support player. And that support player wants to be taking Stand Firm and Guard. Uh, and that allows you to be able to fight and lets the actual Blitzing Storm Vermin do some work. I think it'd be a mistake to not actually stick Mighty Blow in there slightly further down the skill, skill path if you still want him alive. Because why not? And at that point, maybe you do want to go Claws just to add a little bit more firepower and depth into the team. Or you want to go into something like Tackle if you're playing into a lot of Elves. 
again, meta depending on, on what you're playing into. I have seen some very interesting Storm Vermin built with some secondary skills in mind. Defensive, of course, is, uh, is a favourite. I haven't talked about it for a day or two, so why not? Got Dodge, if you want to combine that with Block, Dodge, Guard and Stand Firm. That's a, that's a really annoying player and absolutely will get value out of that. And then here, I don't think we want to take anything like Sidestep. Uh, Stand Firm is just a cheaper and better skill now. But you could think about maybe Diving Tackle uh, if you've gone into the Stand Firm Tackle, Diving Tackle kind of route because this player is an absolute menace at that point. No, there's no passing skills you want to come into and possibly past Claws or maybe Two Heads if you're having to dodge away a lot. Um, there's nothing really in here that I would, would like to take. In terms of uh, statistic upgrades, movement eight, I don't think it's a great idea. You've already got lots of fast players. You don't need to be moving from seven to eight. Would I say for a stat in general? Well, I'd certainly consider it. Strength would be absolutely amazing, uh, even though it's now costed at 80k. Agility is pretty good. That allows you to move around. I think on the support storm vermin, agility might be useful. On the killer storm vermin, it's, it's a bit of a waste. We don't need the passing skill, and I don't really think we need the armor value skill. So the only time really we're fishing for a stat is if we're going to go in here. And at that point, you need to be ready to take the double skill for when you inevitably miss looking for one of the better um, strength agility stats. Right, let's talk about the actual reason to play Skaven. That's gutter runners. We're allowed four of these gutter runners. And in almost all builds, you'll find that I will have put them four, all four in at the start. That's because they are probably one of the three, four, five best players in the whole game. Um, and certainly one of the three best players in the game based on the fact that Cyanide have, have only released it uh, 12 races at the, at the start. Now, gutter runners you can build into a variety of different ways. I think there are mainly three gutter runner sort of career paths that you might want to look at. The first and the most obvious is the scoring a natural one turn uh, or one turn in gutter runner. So your opponent scored in all eight turns. You've only got one turn left. We need to do something about that. Gone are the days, unfortunately, being able to stick movement 10 on this player. So it's already as fast as you can possibly make it. So we need to do an improvement to its movement characteristic via skills. Well, that's okay. We can step into our, one of our primary skill trees and we'll just take sprint. Now we can rush three times. We'll take sure feet to increase our ability to guarantee to make those rushes. So we can now move effectively movement uh, 12. The pitch is only 13 squares uh, from the halfway line to the end zone. So so long as we can get pushed forward a square, then we can get into range. And that's where sidestep comes in. And that means that if anyone bounces into this gutter runner, he just can step forward and then he's in range. Now, at that point, once we've got ourselves into range, we need to make sure that we're mobile and we can also reliably receive the ball. And therefore, the other two skills that I think are great on this gutter runner are catch if you need if you're playing a low reroll game. If you're not, you can skip this skill. But we want to come into the mutation tree, take uh, two heads. That's absolutely a brilliant skill. And I would also be looking and fishing for uh, agility increase on the gutter runner to really, really make it uh, super amazing because agility also means that you can accept the ball in tackle zones and that's been one of the other problems in scoring one turn touchdowns. You tend to be in a lot of traffic. If you miss, that's okay because all you need to do is just accept the extra arms. So extra arms, two heads, sidestep, sprint and sure feet give you your five basic skills to go and make a gutter runner absolute menace. When you combine that with a rat gut blitz and it's got juggernaut you're now pushing people back uh, around about 70 percent of the time and that makes a huge difference in fact i think it's more than 70 percent. i think it's uh it's 90 percent. i think that means you get your push on your gutter runner and now he's in scoring range and you can just score which makes scoring a one turn touchdown i wouldn't say trivial but it is it is very reliable so that's the uh, the one turning uh, gutter the next skill path that you could take a gutter runner down is menace gutter runner and that is the type of player that goes and tries to collect the ball off your opponent uh, and do you know, naughty things to them. So for that, we want to step into the general skill tree and we want to look at wrestle, tackle, strip ball. And then by extension, probably dauntless because it's cheaper than horns. So this player is quite content to play one dice or two dice uphill or two red dice, as I should say, which you'll see is the chained dice uh, on the icon because wrestle and tackle and strip ball, if they haven't got sure hands, it's five sides on the dice in six are going to knock the ball loose on either of the two dice that they get to pick. So the probability of causing a, a ball strip at that point is about 89%, 88%. It's very, very strong. Pointless just helps you turn it into two red dice into one dice. And of course, if you can get some guard in there, then that's really good. So that's a, that's another player that I think is a, uh, is a good idea. How would I start that player? I think I'd go wrestle, then into tackle, then into strip. Some people go wrestle into strip. But I think as long as you start with wrestle, 
that's fine. Uh, and then it's one of these two, and then your final uh, skill here is Dauntless. If you do happen to get a fifth skill, then something like Pro can be quite fun, uh, or Sure Hands if you want to double this player up as to not only strip the ball off your opponent, but also to run off with it afterwards. So uh, there's some interesting skills in there. Uh, I have also uh, seen and considered that people take uh, two heads because that gutter runner can then dodge through uh, screens and traffic to get at an opponent. So do also consider the two head skill. Next gutter runner type uh, would be the harassment player. So you've gone and tried to directly strike at the carrier. What you then need is possibly someone or a couple of gutter runners that can uh, cause a, a loose screen, uh, a real problem. So for me, that sort of player is a, uh, a block, dodge, sidestep, diving tackle, uh, shadowing, prehensile tail, like just an annoyance of a player. You get a lot of value out of this player once the ball is deep and, and, and the opponent has only got a few players around to deal with it. You don't get as much value once you, of this player once the ball is inside a cage. So um, your play style then should depend whether you would build non, one or even two of these players. Um, and what does this player look like? Well, he's going to take hits. So therefore, you've already got dodge. Let's bolt block onto that uh, and make him a nice reliable player even though he has any strength too. And then I want to step into the agility tree. Uh, we want to make sure that we can control where he gets pushed around. So we'll take sidestep. Diving tackle. So you're absolutely obnoxious and difficult to get rid of. And then I also really like shadowing. That means that if our opponent is trying to leave, not only we're we playing diving tackle to the result, but if it didn't work, that's fine. We'll shadow. We're going to follow them. And then they're going to have to dodge again. And again. And again. And at some point, diving tackle will work. And we can try and cause the turnover. So... Uh, yeah, th this type of gutter runner is good, but you've got to make the opponent play a loose, wide, spacious game. It's not going to work once the ball is inside a cage. So you might play with none of these, you might play with two of these. If you play with none of these, um, then you're going to probably be relying on stripping the ball uh, with the second gutter runner type that I talked about. And therefore, you need someone to go and recover the ball. At that point, there are two different player types you can use. You've already got a thrower, which is the next player type we're going to talk about. And you could use that. Or you could use your fourth gutter runner slot and you could build a player which is block, sure hands and extra arms uh, or even big hand. So you could just take big hand, sure hands, the player's on the floor, the ball's on the floor, it will be a two plus, we'll just pick it up and we'll leg it. So um, we go two heads, big hand, yes again it's quite expensive because they're, they're secondaries. Um, and then you want to come into here, you want to take block and you want to take sure hands so that you can just reliably pick the ball up. It's not a particularly expensive gutter runner. Uh, in terms of star player points, but it could be quite expensive in terms of running one because you're taking two secondary skills. With this in mind, overall across gutter runners, you'll notice that I have delved into the mutations tree on more than one of the, the builds. And because, because of that, I think it is entirely a reasonable proposition that you come into here and on your first gutter runner, first level up, just random um, as a mutation skill and see what you've got. And once you've got the first couple of mutations, you can actually blend plot out the career paths of all of the gutter runners because you've picked some cheap uh, mutation skills. That's not to say that you should random a gutter runner muta uh, skill every single time. It's just while you are while you don't mind and there's so many gutter runner skills you could take, randoming seems like a really good value. Um, you could also do the same thing in the general tree if there was a lot of different general skills, right? Because you're happy with any of these, you're happy with that, you're potentially happy with that, you're potentially happy with that or that. Yeah, there's so many in here that you could take and the other advantage you've got with gutter runners is they only need three star player points to try for a random. So you could go and score a touchdown in the next game. If you've got the money to cycle a gutter runner, as in rebuy it if it's rubbish, why not? It, it's, it's a great idea to try and keep your costs down, especially you know, beginning of the game. So yeah, I, I would consider randoming, even bizarrely on some of your best players. Okay, next, the thrower. The thrower has had a considerable change is since Blood Bowl 2. And if you're coming in from Blood Bowl 2, the first thing you should notice uh, is this passing stat here. So this thrower passes better than any Dark Elf. Whereas in Blood Bowl 2, this thrower passed worse than any Dark Elf. Uh, so I think he went to throwing school over the holidays and is now able to pass the ball. Unfortunately though, he is still Agility 3+. plus, So it's always a bit of an adventure picking the ball up, even with sure hands. And for a team that can, can do some things incredibly reliably, sure hands can occasionally fail. He has got pass, which is great, so that synergizes really well with a pass 2+. Plus. And this is the type of player that if you need to score uh, a two-turn touchdown, um, you send the thrower in, picks the ball up, he can run seven squares, he can pass the ball, 
He doesn't have animosity or anything like that. Uh, he's absolutely, he's, he's a great player. But he doesn't have any defensive skills and he isn't super reliable at picking the ball up, which is one of his two main core functions. So with that in mind, uh, I think that the skill tree for a thrower should be block to make him a bit more defensive. Mutation skill. I really like the idea of extra arms. So now we can guarantee to pick the ball up pretty much. And this also helps you on, on defense. If you suddenly, the thrower is the closest man standing, he can pick it up. He can potentially pick it up now in a tackle zone. And that's okay. Uh, and I also like the idea of taking things like leader uh, and accurate. Leader is slightly less valuable in terms of overall team value uh, to Skaven now that the rerolls have changed cost. However, uh, Skaven do try and do some very extravagant stuff and therefore running four or even possibly, dare I say it, five rerolls as Skaven ha has been known to do good work. But I personally think three rerolls and leader is probably where I would sit, you know, the four rerolls overall effectively. In terms of randoming skills or taking statistics, I don't think the, uh, the thrower generate uh, gets enough out of any of the statistics to uh, to go for it so i would broadly skip statistics and in terms of randoming uh, i don't think the thrower's got a lot to offer other than picking the ball up and being a bit of a ball caddy so i don't think i would be particularly excited about randoming skills because there's so many skills in here i don't want so av avoid randoming i think unless of course you've just got some spare money you want to cycle the thrower if you didn't get exactly what you wanted Okay, the final player, that's the Skaven Line Rat. The humble Skaven Line Rat at only 50k, really cheap, uh, has a point of movement faster than a standard player for 50k, which is brilliant. Uh, is it is the same strength as a standard player, it's the same agility as a standard player, uh, is the same passing stat as a standard player, but he's paying for his movement with a little bit of the reduced armor. And therefore, uh, because he's also got no block, no dodge, no wrestle, they will die. They will die a lot. Be careful when you stand these guys up. Just don't let them take lots of hits. They're not there to tank stuff. They're there to just screen um, and prevent your gutter runners getting punched. But they will die. Now, with that in mind, there are some general skills that you need to consider with Skaven. Uh, I really like Wrestle on Line Rats because that creates space. It also turns them into secondary ball blitzers if you need to. And with their strength three, that's fine. I like Kick on at least one, well, say at least one, on one of your players. So we're stepping into the um, the general tree here. So I'm taking this, I'm taking this. Uh, I think there's advantage in taking block. That's fine. I absolutely want to be running a dirty player, Skaven. So that's fine. And then other skills that would be reasonable. I think Fend is also an okay pick once you're combining that with either wrestle or block. I've seen players take tackle as a secondary just to support, secondary pick that is, uh, just to support the Storm Vermin. And so because of that, there are so many skills again in here that I'm okay for the line rats to take, I think that it's totally reasonable that you can run them up the first three, four, five sca uh, Skaven line rat skills and then build on top of that after that. If you want to uh, be able to fight yourself, then it's okay to pick, pick the odd guard line rat here or there because that allows you to be able to fight uh, and, and take, the, take the brawl back to them. Just don't expect these players to live for a particularly long time. Nothing else in here I think is a good idea and certainly avoid that. With respect to... Statistic increases, uh, same really goes for as for most of the Skaven. I'm not bothered about uh, a line rat um, getting an increased movement. I'm also not bothered about strength. I'm really not bothered about agility. Don't care, and no, not really. The only, only stat here I would even consider is armor value. And at that point, I'm paying 18 star player points for an armor value increase. Hey, you've got to question the mor yeah, the morality of it, really. So I would, I would avoid would voice statistics altogether. That covers out your players. There's quite a lot to talk about with Skaven, but hopefully you've now got a good understanding of what you can do with them and, uh, and how they play. Right, let's talk rosters. Some days I have had a real problem trying to find three different competitive rosters for you. Uh, today I've had the opposite problem. I definitely could have written maybe five or even six rosters. However, I've limited it to the usual three. So with that in mind, let's dive into the first roster. Uh, roster 1, I have gone for the concept of putting all of the core players in, and that is all four gutter runners, two storm vermin, and the rat ogre. Again, I've put the spaces in to ho try and help uh, you guys see all the different players, and then I've rounded it out uh, with some cannon fodder. Sorry, uh, line rats all the way down to 11 players. Now, that meant I've only been able to put two team rerolls in, so we are a little bit light on reliability at the very beginning of this roster. However, uh, because it doesn't quite fit to the standard thousand, we did have 30k left over. 
I've slammed that into some dedicated funds and that means that you're generating a little bit of extra re uh, revenue straight out of the gate, which is important for your team that's going to die. So uh, roster one, the idea is you've got all your big players straight away. Right, roster two. This roster is a slightly more rounded roster and I haven't put the Rat Ogre in, which is uh, for some people probably a deal breaker. Uh, however, because we don't put the Rat Ogre in, um, I'm able to take two Storm Vermin, all four go to runners. I've got loads of line rats here, so it's actually a 12-man roster rather than 11. So in the second half of your first game, there's a chance you'll still have 11 players. We also got three team rerolls. So again, you've enhanced your survivability. We've enhanced the uh, reliability of the roster. And I haven't also had to compromise on the dedicated fans. Now, I did say I could write loads of different rosters. You'll notice that dedicated fans have cost me 30k. A line rat costs 50k. You could easily drop all three dedicated fans and then uprate a line rat into a thrower if you feel like you need additional um, ball carrying. Um, I'm not sure you would need that, but that it is there as an option. The final roster build is this one. And this one, I put the Rat Ogre back in, back in again because I think they're fun. I also want to then focus on three rerolls. And then because of that, what else can you get with the idea that you've got your Rat Ogre, you've got the three rerolls, and I wasn't prepared also to drop and can um, uh, compromise on the Blitzers, the Storm Vermin. So at that point, what I then ended up with was only two gutter runners. However, if you've got two gutter runners, you need a ball carrier. So you've got a ball carrier, you've got two gutter runners that maybe just go on flank on either side, and then we've got a load of line rats. It is unfortunately only 11 players. However, of the rosters, I think all three are playable. I kind of like this one. I don't know why. I just do kind of like this idea that, that you've got the, 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 the thrower straight out the gate. We've got only two gutter runners, which is fine, but we've got the rat ogre. I've got my three team rerolls. And I've got a little bit of fan, uh, fan favourite, you know, dedicated fans down here. Now, if you wanted to take another twist on this roster, you could drop the thrower back down to a line wrap. That will give you 35k back here. It will also give you the uh, 5k here, so you've got 40k. And if you wanted to go for maximum earnings, you can have six fun dedicated fans out the gate. That six dedicated fans would mean your starting team value is only 1940. You're also getting inducements at that point. So there is something to be said. Um, for playing this weird min-max roster and you can play around with this one as well. So I think Skaven rosters are a really good fun way of playing with the game and maybe you've got a roster that I haven't covered. If you have, put it in the comment section below. Um, I'd be interested to see what other monstrosities are out there. So yeah, that's rosters. Right, when it comes to uh, how to play Skaven and setups, that probably could determine it. Yeah, I could give you its own video on how to play Skaven because there's so many different ways you can play them and so many different situations that you would need to understand how they all work. For that, I'm just going to cover this as in a basic idea of how to play Skaven. And I'm going to assume, first of all, you're just trying to score in eight turns. Uh, with that in mind, I've just protected three of my gutter runners here. Uh, we've got so many positionals on the field and only three line rats. But I ended up putting one of the gut gutter runners slightly more exposed than the others. I've put my thrower back here. Now you can get around that, of course, if uh, the thrower goes here, a line a gutter runner then takes the place of the thrower and we end up bringing on our extra line rats so that we can protect our gutters because the gutters will be these four players here. But for the purpose of this video, I'm gonna go with that. The idea here is just scoring in eight turns. If you wanted to score really quickly, um, all you need to do is probably put three gutter runners on one side, um, maybe over like this. Um, protect them with a line rat so that they can't be blitzed if, so, if something bad happens at the kickoff and then keep one gutter runner over here uh, and again you probably want to protect it something like that and the reason you don't put all your gutters on one side is because your threat at that point is really limited and you can only go in this example you could only go to the left so do keep yourself a secondary option and remember this gutter runner only needs to be a couple of squares inside your opponent's half to also be a genuine, genuine scoring threat and at that point you'll find that your opponent's defense is split all the way across the field, which really helps your actual primary force potentially break through. Or if they leave a gap that they shouldn't have done, number six gutter runner in this example squeaks through, is able to score. So that's your balance set up. On defense, I think there are some uh, interesting different options. And uh, here I've gone for a 3-4-4 four, four setup. The 3-4-4 four, four is referencing how many players in a line you've got so I've gone for the offset line of scrimmage. And the idea of the offset line of scrimmage is to give yourself a lot of ability to attack through. Uh, even on defense, you're going to want to play kick and rush blood bowl. You're going to kick the ball into a corner and you're going to chase after it um, and try and 
steal it off your opponent. Uh, with that in mind, um, we do want to try and put a uh, line rat somewhere on here. And at that point, if you have got a line rat with kick, um, at the moment I'm representing having a thrower. If you've got a line rat with kick, just swap them around so that they're over here. And you'll notice that I've had to put the the, uh, the rat ogre on the front line and then both storm vermins. So if you've got kick, you want to go something like that. Next, if you want to go with a wide setup, uh, this is very good if you are defending a short drive or if you, again, want to try and play kick and rush blood bowl. Um, this setup gives you maximum threat across the field. It's actually slightly more threat than the first setup because you're covering both wide zones and you can get down the left flank or the right flank. I happen to have split the line of scrimmage here. This is on the assumption that your opponent is attacking with only a couple of turns to go. If you're playing into an eight turn drive, then I would probably combine the line of scrimmage like this. Uh, the reason for splitting it is because nine is just kind of getting in the way of two. So when he gets knocked over, he's, he's just taking up one of these squares. That could be a minor annoyance for your opponent. Or maybe he doesn't fall over and he just uses up some player actions near where your opponent might choose to blitz through, which will be two or three. And uh, you'll notice then I've put the gutter runners th uh, five, six and seven here. And then unfortunately uh, on one of the sides, we've had to stick an extra gutter runner at the front. So I'm exposing the gutters. So... This is not a general setup. This is probably more of a defensive, um, a defending a lead type setup because exposing your gutter runners every single turn to an opening blitz is going to get you into a lot of trouble. Now with that in mind, I unfortunately had to bring in one of the most distasteful setups in all of Blood Bowl and that's the rule of five setup, uh, this one here. Now I think it's a bit of an anchor of a setup. You'll have to really decide for yourself. Uh, but what it does do for you is I've able to define, defend all four of my gutter runners here. Really should have done it that way around. There we go, four, five, six, seven. Uh, and then we've also put a thrower here. So you're able to defend all of your, your, your star men straight away. Always stick the the, uh, the rat ogre directly behind the line of scrimmage. And I would also advise not offsetting it uh, in this example because you don't need to. You're not playing kick and rush blood ball anymore. You're playing pr protect five. So uh, you can use this setup uh, if you have very little imagination. <laughs> no, if you need to defend all gutter runners, that this is the setup that, that works. Um, the reason I'm joking around with you is because uh, I'm famous on stream for talking about how little I like this setup and how inflexible it is, even with Skaven, uh, because what will happen is your opponent will start setting up um, from about this square over here, uh, and they will then finish their setup here, and it's very difficult for you to get around, or you've got to bend your runs so you're not using all of your movement forwards. You're, moving some, you're using some of your movement to go sideways. So uh, that's not as good. With that in mind, if you do want to come and see me stream, uh, I stream on Twitch. Uh, it's twitch.tv forward slash Andy Devo. I stream five days a week. During the week, it is typically from around about seven o'clock in the UK time, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then I also stream on a Saturday and Sunday evening from about 5 p.m. And this is all in the UK time. It'd be great to see you. Uh, come and say hello and, and ask any question about Blob you want to ask. With that in mind, let's dive into the final section of the video uh, and talk about strategies. Right, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about strategy and, and general tactics in terms of what are we going to do with Skaven. Uh, I said in the, uh, in the previous section that there was a, a, so many different things you could do, um, but I'm going to just break it down in terms of some general pointers. Uh, first of all, on offense, I think that one of the best things you can do with Skaven is to try and actually slow your offense down a little bit. It's super easy to go and score a two-turn touchdown with Skaven, you give the ball to a gutter runner, go and stand in range, score. That's great. The problem with that is that your opponent is then going to get seven turns to score back if you start the game and score. And unless you're super confident you can stop them or better turn them over, you're going to lose almost all of those games because they're going to score on turn eight. Then they're going to start the ball with the second half and they score on turn 16 and there's going to be nothing you can do about it. What you want to do is to start with the game, let's go and pick the ball up and just drag it back here. And ideally, just keep the ball back here for a couple of turns. You'll take your line of scrimmage hits and then end, you'll end up getting overwhelmed. And what you want to try and do, ideally, uh, is to fall back behind a screen that has players with um, two, play, uh, two spaces between them. And you end up building what is known as an uh, inverted pyramid. So that your opponent can squidge into you here um, and they will be able to touch you, but you're ending up creating uh, an upside down pyramid. So if they blitz number nine out of the way, they can come and touch these players here but 6 uh, and 10 and 5 uh, and 7 are still going to be free. And every turn, you're going to be able to reshuffle that pyramid and just drop back a little bit and drop back a little bit. 
and it will slow your opponent down and they won't be able to put pressure on the ball because it's it's in your inverted pyramid. Um, and yeah, sure, they might run around the side. Well, that's fine, your ball carrier can run over here. If they run around both sides, they're now committing a lot of players. You might actually run into their half, not to try and score, but just to run away from them. Uh, if anyone's seen this, the sketch with Benny Hill running around a park, completely mad and loopy, that's you. You need to just run anywhere. It doesn't matter where, just run away. That, that'll help you slow down your offense. If you score on maybe turn five or turn six, that's fine because there's a chance you might just squeak a second. But also, you're putting your opponent under a lot of pressure that they having to play a quick turn, quick half for them. And they might create a mistake. And again, yeah, you, you might be able to steal the ball. So consider just slowing your offense down. Take your line of scrimmage and then just start trying to just drop into this um, upside down pyramid shape. Um, or better yet, just run away. Those strategies absolutely work. On defense, it, it changes around a little bit and there are two different strategies you can employ. The first you can play is high pressure blah ball where you kick into a corner and everybody you possibly can get charges after the ball and you try and break the cage before it even properly forms. Super effective with gutter runners. The rest of your players are movement seven. You should be able to uh, kick and rush quite effectively. With that strategy in mind, if it's turn one, do not consider defending at all. Nobody needs to stay in your half. Not a sweeper, not a anything, because you want them to try and attack into your half and then you can just chase them down and then chase them into the end zone where they scored on maybe turn four or turn five or turn six. So do not try and split your forces and keep some people safe. You're actually off-putting your opponent from running into your half at that point, which is the exact thing you actually want to happen. If you can't do that and you find that your opponent has actually caged up, then the other thing you can do is then you want to ignore the ball. You should have a player that can reasonably score a one-turn touchdown. So you know you're going to score on turn eight anyway. Start thinking about trying to pick one of their players off. If in this example, this was our opponent's team um, and the ball carrier was here and you knew you couldn't get at it, let's just blitz number three and knock it over here. At this point, maybe our dirty player and a few line rats can come over here and kick him in the face. And now he's off. And the next turn, you've got this same setup. And next, you pick on number 10. You do that, you kick it off, you go over there. Now it's starting for your opponent just, just noticeably getting a little bit more difficult to defend. You, know, you can stand off a little bit if you want to, and you take out number six and you move that out of the way. Um, number seven ball carrier now has to go into a proper cage look. At that point, it's starting to get a bit more difficult to do anything because one and two uh, players are starting to struggle to make headway. Next turn, we kick another one and move it away. And this doesn't have to be removals. You can, of course, keep these players over here just out of the way, marked by several of your players. And so what you're trying to do is split your opponent's team. That's the next defensive strategy. It's effectively called uh, splitting your team and ignoring your uh, ignoring the ball carrier. Um, you can commit it with everything. You can commit to it with half of your players. Just make sure that when you split, you commit much more than your opponent. And then there's a third strategy you've got with Skaven, uh, which is that you might choose if this is a cage, and we'll just make it nice and neat for a second. So this is a standard cage. Of course, in the reality, there will be players around it, but... In a standard cage, you come over here, you blitz number 11, so it's now knocked over in that square there, and then your sidestep, diving tackle, gutter runner comes in here and takes his place. If that's going to be the case and that's the strategy you're going for, then do make sure that wherever their tackle players are, or player, you've gone and marked that with an appropriate player so that your gutter runner then doesn't get smashed in the face with tackle mighty blow. Otherwise, you'll only get to do that one time. <laughs> so do think about trying to disrupt your opponent's cage but if you're going to do that, you can't just do it with one player. That's where you then play pressure bowl and everybody then presses in. Even though you're on the seven, you just play a high press game and you attack all of the cage and all of the support players at once with all of your players. So you go from completely standing off to being completely up in their face uh, in one turn. And this can then generate uh, turnovers and you will be able to steal the ball score. I hope that section was useful. Now we're going to turn the actual last section of the video, uh, which is going to be inducements. Okay, as usual, we'll split the inducement section into the three different sections, basic inducements, star players, and mercenaries. Uh, I'm also going to start with the standard mercenaries. In here, broadly, I would ignore everything unless you need specifically a rat ogre for some reason, uh, but I think star players will fill a better void than the rat ogre. Um, so really, I'm just looking at maybe hiring a Skaven line rat and giving it dirty player if that's what I need to do uh, because there are opponents that may be only rostering 11 players. Actually, the best inducements for me uh, is that one there. Even though the, the Zap has got considerably worse, it's changed from a 2+, plus to a 3+, plus. I think owning a Wizard with Skaven, the ability to fireball a group of players, brilliant. 
And for me, this is one of the first things I would be picking up uh, in a competitive environment. After that, I think there's a lot of value in adding Bloodweiser kegs because your, your players are at low armor value. You're going to get KOs. You're going to lose people. So adding one or even two Bloodweiser kegs at this point makes a lot of sense. You should have enough team rerolls, so I don't think you need to go anywhere near there. The only time you take a bribe is if your opponent has only got 11 or 12 players and you think that you can actually do and pull off the fouling strategy, uh, the one I talked about in the previous section. Chef is way overpriced. It's a big waste of money. A Wandering Apothecary, matchup specific. Sometimes they do have use. Um, in general ladder format, I would say not. And then these two are just used as usual for, for cannon fodder and filling up and spending the random 20k. And Biased Referee, if your opponent has lent heavily into the fouling meta, then keeping some of your players on the field makes a lot of sense. But uh, really for me, the, these two inducements here, uh, the Wizard and Kegs, actually make a lot of sense. With respect to star players, Skaven in the board game have an awful lot of uh, star players, some of which are brilliant. Uh, at the moment, at the beginnings of Blood Bowl uh, 3, uh, we've only got five star players to pick from, uh, which unfortunately is, is a bit light, really. And I do hope that we can get around to adding a lot more uh, in the future. Now, of these five... Um, Hackflame is an absolute star man, but you got to run as broadly do everything Hackflame does. So I can't imagine that anyone really needs to be taking a, a, a fifth gutter runner uh, here. So I would I would say no to Hackflame. Helmet Wolf, again, I don't think there's a lot of value. He takes up the same slot as a wizard, really, for the same value. A wizard wins all day for me. Uh, Ripper Bolgrot can add a lot of strength and can be used in conjunction with a Rat Ogre, potentially. He's a troll that doesn't have really stupid. So you'll get some value out of Ripper. He is a bit expensive, unfortunately, but not as expensive as in the previous edition. So, you know, he's all right, but I think a wizard uh, is where you want to start. And then we move into these two. Uh, Vareg's, I think, is better value than Ripper. Uh, although he's a point of strength less, he does have blocks, so he's a lot more reliable. And he's also got Jump Up, Mighty Blow, which is the same, uh, and Thick Skull, so he's less likely to leave the field. So I like Vareg. I think he's a good star player. And at strength five, he's a real, real bargain. And then we've got Morgan Thorg. If you can take Morg, you should. That's as simple as it gets. Uh, I don't know how many other ways I'm going to be able to slice this. He's got Mighty Blow plus two. He's got Strength six. He's got Block. He's got Thick Skull. He's an absolute monster. Um, he should frankly be banned. I'll climb down off my soapbox now. Um, but he is, um, he, yeah, he's, he's far too good. If you've got the ability to hire Morg, um, you absolutely should. So we're going to stick him in the cart and hopefully take him away. Uh, with that in mind, I think that's everything from uh, from me on this guide video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I appreciate any of the comments that you might leave. Uh, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe. That would be really helpful for me in the channel. And until the next one, I've been Andy Davo. It's been brilliant. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, I'll see you in the next guide.